to show you the difference between what we call the upper trapezius and the middle and lower trapezius. And as you can see there, there those fibers travel in a lot of different directions, right? They travel up, they travel across, they travel down. There is no muscle in the human body that moves in so many directions as a trapezius. There is no muscle that is that fan-shaped that pulls in that many different directions. So um, here's Frank Zane, a famous bodybuilder, if you don't know who he is, and I'm pointing to his trapezius, his upper, his upper trapezius from the front. So to show you that the objective when we're doing physique development is to make that muscle rise and fill in what might otherwise be kind of an empty kind of a gap. Now you'll notice that his kind of go concave. Some people's trapezius go more convex. Um, and that's really sort of a genetic thing. I'm sure that he trained his trapezius as hard as, as the guy who has the more rounded um, convex trapezius. But some people are just more bulk oriented in terms of the way they develop and some are not. I am more ectomorphic like Frank Zane. And so we tend to have slightly less massive trapezius. Um, beautifully designed this uh, anatomy of ours to cover all the angles. Um, a lot of times, you know, when you talk to a bodybuilder and you say, you know, what are the muscles of the upper back? They mention the rhomboids. Well, that's sort of a ridiculous thing to mention because the rhomboids are not visible. They're behind the trapezius and they do almost everything, essentially everything the trapezius does. They basically assist the trapezius. So when you're doing any kind of scapular retraction or scapular elevation, any kind of show, you're already working both groups of muscles. There's no reason why you should separate rhomboid function, and there's no reason why you should separate rhomboids from a visible development standpoint. So on my left arm here, you'll see that little thing right there, which is that aponeurosis. And over here, you'll see that I don't have it. Right? So it's just like a little tendon. It, 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 it isn't it isn't a tendon because tendons connect to bones, but it's just a little piece of fascia um, that connects over here. And, and, it, and it's not does not mean that you can somehow use that to change the shape of your muscle. As we talked about before, you have a situation where the bicep is pulling on this or insertion here, mostly parallel to the forearm level. That means most of the force that is required of the arm will be going in rather than up. So to combine, let's say, an arm that's like this, a mechanical disadvantage with a, a very horizontal lever, that's really bad. This is ideal. Maybe a slight angle is, but once you get into an angle like this, now you've got too much starting load with a mechanical disadvantage. And so you're going to put your, your bicep tendon at a tremendous risk there. What you'll also notice is that when you do a preacher curl, you'll notice it's really heavy in the beginning and then really easy at the end, right? Because as you, the more you bend your elbow, the more you improve your mechanical advantage, but yet your rear resistance is diminishing. In other words, you're getting stronger when the weight's getting lighter. You're getting weaker when the weight is getting heavier. That's why that feels so weird and so backward. Again, I want to emphasize to you that, you know, um, a lot of what I'm saying goes against conventional wisdom. Uh, some people are believers in old school training. Trust me, I'm old school too, right? I'm 60 now. I started competing when I was 16 years old in 1976. So I was around in those days when, you know, they had flat leg extension machines and flat leg curls machines. And, uh, and, and you know, a lot of the machines that are, that are available right now didn't even exist. Not to say that they're all necessarily good, but I know old school training. And I also knew, no what might be considered considered new school training, functional training, uh, a lot of the stuff that is being propagated right now that is supposed to be hip and contemporary and trendy. Um, and, and, and what we try to do here is we try to look at the reasonableness of all this stuff. We, we, we have to be able to apply science to it, like the farmer carry, for example. It, there's no doubt that a lever is parallel, the way that's parallel to gravity is neutral. There's no doubt about that. We can, I can have a lever device here. I can prove it to you, right? Yet when you're doing a farmer carry, your forearms are vertical, parallel to gravity. Your upper arms are parallel to gravity. Almost every limb is parallel to gravity. And to the degree that it's slightly not parallel, it's loading its corresponding muscle 
with a slight percentage of the load you're carrying, but the trapezius is certainly loaded because the clavicles are perpendicular to gravity, right? The fingers are perpendicular to gravity because they're wrapping around, right? The feet are perpendicular to gravity, so the calves are loaded, but there has to be a method to the way we evaluate things, right? And we know that full range of motion is better than partial range of motion, is better than isometric, right? So when you're seeing somebody carrying around a pair of heavy dumbbells uh, and you see their upper trapezius that we talked about today, you see them bulging, well, yes, I mean, I, I can do a crab and I can make my upper trapezius bulge, but that doesn't mean that isometric load on my triceps is the best way.